my name's Mike Briers, and I've been lucky enough to be a snow coach driver here in Yellowstone for over 20 years. And my job is to show people the wildlife and the thermal features. And, and today I got my friend Larry with me, a Sioux Indian from Lame Deer, Montana. We're comparing notes on buffalo between Yellowstone and Custer State Park. And I'm learning a whole bunch from him, and I hope he's learning some from me. He's a top hand, and it's always good to run with a top hand. These buffalo are amazing critters to see them survive in the winter here and make a living in this deep snow. And I, I look at them and think, well, this takes me back 200 years when things were wild and free. And imagine in the old days when the Indians would make their whole living off of these buffalo, it made their clothes, their food, their shelter, everything they needed. Also, I'm a painter and I like to paint these buffalo and look at the shape of them. They're, they're very beautiful. It's like going to France and looking in the caves at the old paintings of old man and it's the same animal we're looking at now. They've been here a long time. So here in Yellowstone is one place that they're left to roam free and wild and just takes a fellow back. We had to eat before the buffalo came. Oh, look at this little ah. cow. <laughs> oh, now don't run. Oh, feeling good in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, they're just having fun this morning. We try real hard not to run them in here uh, to use up that energy they can't afford to lose. Right. But this bunch, why? They're just enjoying themselves. Sometimes people get killed in here, coming too close to them, getting to, trying to get a picture of them. They see them standing on the side of the road, and they say, "What? Well, why they must be tame? Yeah. Let's get a picture and put little Johnny on one." And we, we call it recreational Darwinism. And yeah. Kind of thins out the dumb ones, but he's the one that might give us a little bit of trouble. He's probably 1,800 pounds right now. Yeah. Excuse us, old fella. Can we get by? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, look at the horns on yeah. this fella. What's that down there, Larry? There's a ranger down there looking at something. Yeah, yeah, we're looking at something. Keep going, fella. Hello there. What you got here? How you doing? Whatever How happened to this what is it, cow buffalo, huh? Hard to tell exactly, but the carcass has been there for a couple of days. Yeah, it doesn't look like, like it's a very old one. How do you think that buffalo died? Do you think uh, wolves killed it or what? Well, just from the way it looks, it certainly does not seem to be from a wolf or any other sort of a predator. So my guess is it's because of the winter. Possibly it was a little weak to begin with. We probably will never know for sure. Uh, but it's a natural death, nothing, nothing else. And probably a couple of days, certainly cooled off with the snow laying on it. And some animals were, animals were starting to feed on it a little bit earlier. If it stays intact for a few more weeks, the the bears will be out in the early spring and that's right and they may be this very be happy to find the carcass a good place not to be it is
Larry, I wanted to show you some of the paintings I've been working on here lately, and you know I like to paint the buffalo, and yeah. I love the shapes of them, and especially when they're laying down like that with that back like that. But yeah. this one I put uh, the buffalo, wolves, elk, swans, ducks, an and eagle, eagle there, yeah. a little bit of everything in there. And you know, there's days when you see all that, you know, all at one time. And uh, I'm just always amazed at Yellowstone and how much wildlife there is. But I had fun doing this one, and, and it's the first time I've painted the burned trees. I, I didn't like those trees from that fire of 88, but I used them here, and I kind of enjoyed it. And that just tells, a, tells the whole story about, about Yellowstone yeah. Park, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people have have heard a lot about the thousands of acres, millions of acres that got burned out here, and it, this also tells the story of what what happened. So one one day your your paintings will be in Chicago, New York, and in in the archive somewhere. Yeah, I guess uh, after an artist dies, that's when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully before that. You certainly don't want to die before you. You turn out several more pictures like this. Oh, don't. no. Uh, I'm lucky enough to see four different mountain ranges in three different states from, from here. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I can see Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. pretty aggressive. Oh? Yeah. I've been lost. You've been lost? Yeah, where's AR? The, uh, I think, pretty sure AR's with that bunch right there. Is there, oh, I see coming over the hill there, yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to have to move back, so I said Yeah. Well, I'm going to go uh, see if I can turn these cows back. Yeah, if you gather them up and then there's a few more by the tank up there. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll be here then. My name is Ron Thiel. I'm almost 70 years old. Uh, the owner of the Terry Bison Ranch. We began this ranching in 1987. And uh, at the present time, we have about 3,200 bison on the ranch. Well, before I went into ranching, uh, I spent 36 years in the electrical transmission power line building. Uh, that work was very demanding. Uh, I remember one time I had a job in Alaska, California, and Texas, all at the same time. And so I had to travel a lot to keep tabs on these jobs. I also recall a very difficult job I had in uh, Nevada at the Hoover Dam. And at that point, I uh, kind of decided I need to change my lifestyle. And so in 1987, I went into buffalo ranching. Uh, it was a pretty risky decision because 
At that time, I, I knew very little about them other than I liked them. And uh, the market, there was no established market either, so it was a pretty big gamble. But I chose to do it. I get too nervous. Yeah, I never <laughs> thought it. Who'd have thought it? You play Red River Valley? Oh, well, if I can find the music. It's probably got sore ears by now. to my wife that uh, we're going to change my occupation and uh, buy some land. I wasn't sure what we were going to raise, but I went to the library, and I've always been fascinated by bison, but I went to the library to read about them, and in the library there was very few books on how to raise a buffalo. In fact, there was only one pamphlet about 10 pages long. So I said to my wife, I think I've hit on the right thing to raise because I can help write the book. And so I told her it's going to be Buffalo, and she said that I was crazy. And I said, I'm going to divorce you. That's it. Oh, I wasn't too worried about it. Uh, at that point, we'd been married about uh, oh, 32 years, and, and I know she may get mad at me, but she can't live without me. Here we have approximately 822 of the animals uh, behind me, and uh, they are meat animals. Their destiny is not too uh, good. Uh, they, they will be used for meat. However, it's essential to have ranches to produce bison to increase the numbers and keep them from being extinct. They're also very important to us because we need their, the income, the revenue which sustains our ranch. Buddy, you still my buddy, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. He gives me a kiss. You gonna give me a kiss, buddy, huh? Yes. Here, I'll do it this way, here. Here, now you give me a kiss. Come on, give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Yeah, oh boy. Huh, you my buddy, huh? Yeah. You think that's a bottle? You're too big for the bottle. Oh, look at that, big baby. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm the guy to give you the bottle.
Ross, I wish you'd have been here when I bought this place. The fence was about as high, right? Came up to about here on you. And we turned the buffalo loose and they uh, jumped over, went on the interstate highway, huh. on the railroad that goes through the ranch. Right. Said, you better fix that or, or else. So, That's what happens today. Well, not as bad as then. So we started fencing one summer and I wish you'd have been there because you could have helped. What year? 1991. And we built, uh, what did I, I think uh, the perimeter fence was 16 miles on the railroad. And then there was 20 miles around the outside of the ranch. So we got real good at fencing. Now we built a fence that's five and a half foot high, eight wires. And right. sometimes they still jump over it now, but not as bad. They don't. So uh, we made some progress there. Come on, girls. Yeah, when I was a little boy, I always loved these bison, and I was hoping someday I could be a rancher. And uh, so when I decided to do this, I told my mother about it, and I was in my 50s, and she said, you're too old to start something like that. I said, it might make me young again. Awful tough animals, though. Yeah, they are. We've seen uh, seen some that are right on the edge of death, and I don't know how they quite do it, but they end up nursing themselves back. Oh, we're end of July here, just kind of getting uh, towards the peak of the rut right now. Out uh, looking at bulls, we'll be doing a bull inventory here shortly for the year. Uh, trying to get a count of our age class of bulls. And we'll start getting ready pretty quick for the roundup. Well, I know the first time when I first started getting interested in raising buffalo and the first time I heard one of them bulls roar, the only way for me to explain it to anybody is it just sounds like they think of what an African lion sounds like if they're out there roaring. And I said, you've got a buffalo bull that's trying to show everybody else who the boss is. But that's been quite, it's been interesting watching the behavior of them and communicating. And probably my most favorite time is when them bulls are rutting and fighting. Boy, they really get to bellering and roaring at each other. Roundup has been an interesting part of this position, that's for sure.
we need the meat, and we, we need everything that the buffalo provides for us. But this is the toughest part. I, I, I feel bad to see them like this. It could have been one of our orphan babies that we fed on the bottle, had in our front yard eating our grass for six months and babied. But, but it's got to be this way. It's got to be done. We eat chickens. Why can't we eat these beautiful, big, brown-eyed animals? So I, I don't like it, but we have to do it. I don't think I want to go have lunch. First time in 10 years that this happened. I, I knew it happened. I knew this, this was the end of the buffalo. It has to be. So, yes, and, and we will do this. We will continue. Okay? It's okay with me. Okay. This horse that my boy's riding, Leo, this is the original descendant of the horses that our Native American people, our tribes of Lakota and the Pagan or the Blackfeet people used to chase the buffalo, hunt the buffalo with. We followed them. This horse is very important to our culture. It came from the south, and we call it the big elk dog, Punikamitao. That's how you see what the translation in Blackfeet is, is big elk dog. We use these to run and follow the buffalo, and the buffalo which we call Iniowa, was a staff of life. It was a staff of life for our people. We used every bit of it. It was the first food that our creator gave to us. Back. Long time ago, before, before our, our people had horses, we used a sighting called the buffalo jump to push the buffalo over in, in droves. We would start by taking a big V and herding them over. Our people would hide behind rocks with, with hides to wave and spook the buffalo. They were a very skittish animal. And we would have one man dressed in a dressed buffalo hide with a, with a horn, and he would mimic that he would be a lead, lead buffalo cow. And he would dance and come, and he would jump off the cliff to a, to a set spot, usually a ledge, and the rest of the buffalo would follow them. Hit down here, we would those that did were crippled or, or lame, we would club them, slaughter them. We didn't kill all of them. Most of them stopped, some of them split off. It was a very massive kills at time. We had a lot of food for the winter, lots of hides, and we used that substance that sustained us to the next time we had a drive. I've learned to appreciate how much he loves his horses, how much he loves the sport of anything horseback. Uh, we spent many, many years of high school rodeo with kids camping in a horse trailer, uh, neighbor kids coming to eat supper with us, and it's just been a way of life. So it's been a great, wonderful life with this crazy man sitting next to me. <laughs> Not me. I just had a, I think, a very good life. I wish other, other people. We are not rich by any means, but we are rich because we have many, many friends. Good friends. Larry, it's Mike Breyers. Good, my old friend, how are you? 
Uh, good. Well, um, do you think there's any chance of me riding in that uh, Buffalo Roundup? Hey, Jim, you ready to go with the Buffalo Roundup? Come on, let's go. Yes! Wow! Come on, let's go. Paul over there, tell him you've got a spare battery. Uh, on the Iowa-Wisconsin Minnesota border, uh -huh. and it's all valid. So we've been riding up and down. The only difference is the elevation. Yeah. We're at 700 feet there, sure. 700 to 1,200 feet. How you guys doing? Good, yourself. I can't complain. Don't know what. You got your team. <laughs> That's our old team. No. No. Is it really? Good. Okay. Before we start, if you would favor me, I'll just say a little prayer here for all of us. Heavenly Father, you know all things and uh, you control all things and all these critters on these hills are yours. We thank you for being able to be here. We. Thank you for the folks that are here in leadership capacities, the core team riders and the team leaders. I pray, Lord, that you'd uh, give us all good judgment today. But we just ask your blessing on our gathering here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, the reason you are on the core team is I expect you to dive into a wreck if somebody gets in a bind. And what that means is I expect you to get a buffalo off of an individual. Say a horse goes down and a buffalo has knocked him down. I expect you to go in and get that buffalo off of that guy or individual, guy or gal. And if you have to hit that buffalo with your horse at a dead run, I expect you to do it. Because that's the only way we're going to get that <coughs> buffalo off of somebody. We don't want anybody killed. If you do have to charge into a buffalo, you always do it on the rear end because that's the lightest part of the buffalo and that's where you'll move him. You won't move him at the front, I'll tell you that. They're built like a brick little house.
That was some ride. I've never done anything like that. I can't imagine how people used to make their living chasing buffalo just to get themselves a meal and wait till I get to paint. I wish I could have took pictures while I was riding because that was so amazing to have 1,200 head of buffalo right next to you and running and the horse are moving under you. And it was something else. But you'll see some good paintings coming out of my, off of my easel after this. I, I got it up in my mind what I'm going to paint. And who would have thought I'd ever been able to do something like this? But especially to ride with Larry Thompson and Bob Lannis and all their families and just about the most amazing people I've ever met. Uh -huh. Hey, Mike, come here. Where were you when those buffalo come over the hill here? Up back down in here? Well, I was right in the middle of them. You know when they turn back? Yeah. That's probably the big mistake I made today. I, I thought, I'm going to be the Dutch boy with his finger in the dam there, and but uh, I didn't realize later somebody say, Mike, get out of there. You know yeah. who that was? Me. <laughs> <laughs> South Dakota. That, that's where they run up with that brand. And because it, it's a good looking brand here and it's tan and it doesn't have any dark spots in it, that brand will be there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. The roundup this weekend was meets our management objectives of uh, calling our herd back to numbers that the park can, the rangeland of the park can sustain over a year's time. This year we're in the third year of a drought cycle. We're depopulating, we have been. Um, after we're done this year with our sales avenues that we have, we'll be down to around 805 head total is our overwinter number going into next spring. That uh, will be the lowest that it's been in about 25 years time. Stage one time, he says, stage one. Number 52, would you like the last of those for the same money? 752, just a little three-year-old. You better a young, young cow. Take a look at her now. She's open now. They're telling us she's open now. I got the red tag in her ear. She says, bread on the sheet, but she is an open cow. Chad is so sure as me. 776, one of the larger cows of the day, guys. She's a 10-year-old. She is red. She's weighing 10, 16. Oh, you bet. Take a look at her then. Give me a thousand of the bill. A thousand here, a thousand dollars on a mirror. Got five of the needs of the ham. And five of the needs of the dance of the day. And five of the needs of the dance of the bottom here. And five of the needs of the fire. And now a thousand of the bill. And some of the ham. What do you say with a thousand of the bill? And some of the ham. Give me 800 there. And some of the ham. What time? 800. Some of the ham. 845. Five on the quarter on a mirror. Four at 900 dollars there. One, three, two to the buyer. When you come here, you can pretty well depend on the quality because of their long, long time of selling animals, and they have a good reputation. So you can let your guard down a little here, but when you go to these other sales, you got to look them over pretty carefully. And that's why the prices are high today, probably yeah. because <laughs> people know that the quality is here. 781 is an 800 pound bread. 
two-year-old now. 800-pounder guy, 781. This is a good bull in that he has a real good horn spread on him. You see how the horns are, are curved, they're symmetrical, they're, they're, he really looks good. He's got a lot of front hair on him. Uh, he'll be able to winter well. He's uh, uh, an aggressive bull, so he won't have any problem breeding. Are we out? I don't know. Now, yes, you just want to get her in one more time. <laughs> it's like the good old days, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's a quarter is all, boys. Yeah, that's a little bill. And now it's $700, sir. That's a little bill. What have you been here yesterday? $700 out of here. That's a little bill. Next year, you're going to be sitting out there in the seats going, boy, now they're bringing $850. I wish I had bought those $700 ones. <laughs> Oh, you bought them where you want them? Yeah. <laughs> Saved you a little money there. <laughs> I think we'll start buying where we want them. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I'm back in the saddle again. Riding the range once more, toting my old 44, where we sleep out every night, and the only law is right. I'm back in the saddle again. Whoopie tie, I yo, rocking to and fro, back in the saddle again. Whoopie tie, ah, yeah, I go my way. I'm back in the saddle again. I'm back in the saddle again. Hey, yes, you are. Hey. Hey. Yeah, I've known Larry for 40 years, and I never knew he could sing. <laughs> I didn't know it until last night. <laughs> Can you think of a better way to die than riding a horse beneath a clean, clear sky? The sun just coming over a prairie ridge, the early light just forming a bridge between the dark of night and the light of day. I just don't think there's a better way. Ride around your little doogie, ride around them slow, for the fiery and snuffy are raring to go. And when I die, take my saddle from the wall, put it on my pony, lead him out of his stall. Tie my bones to his back, turn our faces to the west, and we'll ride the prairie that we love the best. Ride around, you little doogie, ride around them slow, for the fiery and snuffy are raring to go. Ride around, you little loogie, ride around them slow, for the fiery and snuffy are raring to go.